This is Support is Sexy, episode 540, with Sashi Chandran, CEO of Tea Drops. Welcome to Support is Sexy. I'm your host, Elaine Fluker, entrepreneur, author, and founder of Chic Rebellion Media. Five days a week, Monday through Friday, I bring you inspiring women entrepreneurs who share their wins and lessons to help you take your business to the next level. Here we go. Hi, everyone. Welcome to a new episode of Support is Sexy. I'm so happy to have you here. You know, it just would not be the same without you. And I am excited to bring you our guest today, Sashi Chandran. And you know, Sashi reached out to me via email and sent me this incredible, incredible tea. If you follow me at all on social media or hear me even talk about food, tea is usually involved. I love hot tea, wonderful, tasty teas. I'm a big fan of chai tea. Sashi has a company called Tea drops. But what I love about tea drops and what's different about them is there are no tea bags. Not only that, the packaging is beautiful and she has teas that are in lovely shapes that just make it fun to drink, but also easy to drink. And not that I'm doing an advertisement for tea drops, but what I love about the company, well, one, Sashi is wonderful, but also it reminded me of the importance of small innovations. Sometimes we think as entrepreneurs, if we're coming up with our big idea, one, we're looking outside of ourselves and not even looking at problems that we have within our own lives and day-to-day experiences, which Sashi shares in this episode was something that brought her to this idea of even creating tea when she was doing something totally different before or creating this kind of tea, an easy way to make it when she was doing something totally different before. So we don't do that. But then we also think the innovation has to be something that's going to shift the whole world and make a huge dent in the universe in some kind of way that's going to change the way we all do things. Now, maybe it will, but it could start with some small innovation such as no longer using tea bags. One, it makes it easier for you to make. Also, it's great for the environment, but so many things have come from this small innovation that Sashi thought of, created this business, bootstrapped it in the beginning, ended up raising $2 million, and talks to us in this episode about that part of the process too, and how she's maintaining the culture of her company, a company that started with one great idea. All right, so I know you're going to enjoy this episode. Without further ado, Sashi Chandran. So Sashi, thank you so much for joining us for an episode of Support is Sexy. I'm excited to chat with you. I am as well. Thank you so much for having me. Of course. So our first question, when did you first fall in love with entrepreneurship? I grew up in a very entrepreneur-focused household, I guess you could say. Uh, Even though my parents were not the traditional definition of entrepreneurs, um, they were both immigrants to the U.S. So my dad came when he was 28 to do his MBA here in Los Angeles. And my mom came to this country from China when she was young and worked in a Chinese restaurant, grew up there. And my parents both met um, in college in, L- in Los Angeles. And your dad's and from one, China too? My dad's from Sri Lanka. Okay. Yeah. So, um, so I think having you know, immigrant parents who really just had to hustle, right, to make things things happen in the mm-hmm. U.S. Um, my parents ended up both working corporate jobs, but they always had these side hustles. So my dad's side hustle would be, um, you know, saving money and buying a, his first piece of real estate in Los Angeles. And from there, um, saving more and buying more and more properties. And for my mom, my mom dabbled in a lot of different things, but she... Um, She also, for a short stint of time, not a short stint of time, during my childhood, she had left the corporate world to raise my brother and I. But even while raising us, she would have this, this, um, she owned a crystal store in in a swap meet. And so like, when I say crystals, I mean crystal vases and and beautiful porcelain like Carpe de Monte. Mm -hmm. And she would work this booth uh, on the weekends. And so I was always exposed to parents that express themselves. Yes, they had corporate jobs, but they always had these different expressions of entrepreneurship and was influenced by that. So I I saw hustle firsthand and I kind of just fell in love with the process of you know, having, having your hand in a lot of different pots of, of trying new things, of figuring out and solving problems. 
um, even though each of their expressions of hustle were different. Um, I didn't even know it at the time, but I was being exposed to a lot of um, entrepreneurship elements early on. For you, did it just feel like this is what mommy and daddy do? Did it, or did you, were you aware that they had these full-time jobs and they were creating or doing these other things no, on the side? No, I, I wasn't able to connect the dots so much later on in life. Right. Um, you know, even, even now, you know, starting the company, I didn't, it, it took me a while to connect the dots that, wow, I actually learned a lot about entrepreneurship um, through my parents and then realizing and tracing their past that they had always taken risks. They had always um, had their own expressions of, of, of you know, conveying their, their passion for different things. And uh, that's, that's definitely, it can't help but influence you, right, as you go on in life. Tell us your um, where you grew up and what you were like as a young person, of course, observing your parents in this way, but how would you describe the young Sashi? Young Sashi grew up in Los Angeles and um, my parents actually lived, so we, so I was born in, in um, kind of urban Los Angeles and then we moved to more of a, a mountain canyon region um, in Malibu. And growing up, I actually, you know, it was a pretty remote area. So I didn't have a lot of friends my age growing up, like I would say from, from three till 12. Um, I was, I had an older brother and I would, I would join in and play with his friends, but I really didn't have a, a group of friends of my own. Mm-hmm. So that meant I had to be really creative. And, um, I remember, uh, loving to, to kind of work with my hands. So Plato was, was big for me. Um, just having big imagination in terms of, um, like climbing the different rocks and, and, um, thinking in my head, like they were different obstacle courses. So I just had like a wild imagination. Yeah. They create your own fun. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I had to create my own fun, had to find different outlets. Um, you know, fun when my mom was busy, my mom obviously hung out with me a lot, but like I, I would, I would always kind of be, be creating these games on my own or exploring our different neighborhood. Um, I remember being obsessed with the flowers, the wildflowers, um, the California, you know, native wildflowers and, and picking them and trying to crush them and make perfume out of them. So there's always this like experiential, um, you know, element to my childhood. If I just wanted to like create stuff, even with Play-Doh, I would, I would make up, um, different types of, of food or cakes with it. And so I remember that being, being part of my expression early on. I so I love Play-Doh. I love just reminiscing I mean, as I hear you talk about it. Yeah, I mean, even now, like just the feel of play yes, you know, it's, it's just, just like it. yes. Oh, it's just this, <laughs> I, I love it. <laughs> and so I was, you know, more of an introvert growing up, and I mean, mm-hmm. I'm still in a, okay, but um, uh, it forced me, I think, early on because I didn't have you know access to plenty of friends or even just any social stimulation that I really had to create a lot of that for myself. What would you say were your aspirations for when you grew up? Did you have an idea of what you wanted to quote unquote be? I never had a set clear idea. I mean, I I fell in love with tea and tea culture early on, probably when I was seven or eight, when I had my first true high tea, tea time experience. And obviously I was influenced by my my parents' um, heritage of tea being a huge part of our upbringing. In both cultures. in both cultures. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But I also found that I was inspired, you know, for a while I thought I wanted to be a chef because I love just playing with food. I remember getting this cookbook early on as a kid. Um, and my mom and I would make these different recipes and I thought, okay, I, maybe I'd be a chef. But then I got into, um, you know, one of my friends was really into sketching and, 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 and um, clothing design or fashion design. And I thought for a while, you know, I, I, I wasn't super creative in the sense that I could sketch or draw, but I loved playing with different patterns and I loved color. And so for a while I thought I would do that. And then even early on, I had this jewelry business where I would make, um, I would go to the bead shop and make these necklaces, sell them for three to $4 to my friends at school. So I always had this creative um, aspect to, to my childhood. And I guess, you know, you could say that's, that's, um, also where I got my first taste of entrepreneurship is making stuff, selling it and, and, and seeing like, oh, wow, other people find value in what I'm creating. And it was a very uh, inspiring feeling. What was your first high tea like 
You said that was when you were seven or eight years old? Yep. So I was part of Girl Scouts. Um, Mm -hmm. I remember being a brownie. And one of our gatherings was having a high tea event, kind of just a, a very, very fun event where we, they dressed us up in these Victorian type of clothing. Mm. And we had high tea at this place called, um, I want to say it's called Rose Cottage in, in the Valley in LA. And it was just, it was so communal and fun. And it, it made us, you know, it was, it was also this creative outlet where we could be someone outside of ourselves, like in these Victorian clothes. And I remember my, my mom being there too. And, um, and some of them, you know, the moms of, of the other girls and everyone was just having a great time. And it was centered around tea and this, this really fancy, you know, high tea experience. And I just, I, I felt that so connected to that. And, um, I kind of just fell in love with that feeling. That community kind of that coming together. Yeah. Yeah. That communal aspect of it. So do you feel like all of that played into the entrepreneur you are today and the company you, you've created Tea Drops? I think so. I mean, community is at the heart of, of why I created Tea Drops. I love that tea is something that brings people together. And that was apparent in my upbringing too. So as I mentioned, my mom's Chinese, my dad's from Sri Lanka. Any family gathering, there was always tea at the center of it. Um, I remember too that when I was sick, my mom would make me a certain type of chrysanthemum tea. Or anytime someone was invited over, we'd have oolong tea. And then when I went to my dad's... Um, family parties, they would serve a black Assam tea or chai tea and all the women would get together. So I always saw tea as this means and vehicle to bridge um, people together, right? To bring communities together. And that's been a a huge focal point for me as I built tea drops that I just don't, I don't want to just be a tea company. Um, I think, you know, obviously we make super unique, flavorful, fun teas. And I think we do so in a very approachable way. Um, that normally, you know, tea is very much this, this almost associated with like snobbery, right? It's this highbrow activity and we just want to make it fun and accessible. But, but to that point, we wanted to make it fun. We want to bring people together. We want to encourage people to, sh- to share um, and talk over cups of tea. And I think when you do that, you, you really realize that you're more alike than different. What are the ways that you feel like tea drops? I love the brand, as you already know. But what are the ways that you can explain to our audience that you feel like tea drops makes drinking tea yeah. fun? Yeah. So tea drops makes an assortment of organic dissolvable teas, and when we say they're dissolvable, we have a couple different lines. Our core tea drops line are these pressed shaped teas, so they come in hearts, stars, flowers. Um, um, because of their shapes and because there's no tea bag, they're eco friendly by design. And when you drop a tea drop into a cup and stir, all of the tea leaves drops to the very bottom of your cup. So it doesn't interfere with your drinking experience. So what a tea drop truly is, it's a whole leaf tea experience of finely ground tea, spices, lightly sweetened with an organic cane sugar, all compressed together into a fun shape. So no matter if you're at the office, at home, or on the go, you can have the perfect cup of tea every time. And they're not in tea bags, regular or what we know of as regular tea bags. No, no, they cut they cut the brewing time. Um, you know that's, that's traditionally associated with making tea. Um, so you know it, it pretty much steeps instantly as soon as you stir it. It's ready to drink. Um, and then the you know the other thing is that it's it's about twenty to thirty percent less waste than a tea bag because it doesn't have the string, the staple, and all the other. Um, packaging associated with with traditional tea bags, right? All the other things that you would normally throw away. Exactly. Now, why was it? Um, even though you told us a little bit about how tea growing up played such a part of your life and culture, but when you decided to launch a business, well, did you work in? Um, did you work at a company first before you launched your business? Yeah. So I was actually in the corporate world for right. um, quite a number of years before launching Tea Drops. Um, I I ended up getting a degree. I told you a lot about the creative side of my childhood, but I ended up getting a degree in economics and a minor in management. Mm-hmm. Um, so at the same time, I was creative, but I also had this very practical kind of logical um, mind, if you will. And um, and so I ended up working at a market research firm and getting into marketing as a career. And I did that in Silicon Valley for five years um, prior to starting T-Drops. It was actually when I was at that job 
that I realized the process to make loose leaf tea is very cumbersome. So, you know, every time I would try to make loose leaf tea at my desk, I would have an arsenal of equipment. I would have a kettle. Mm -hmm. I would have a strainer. I would have to wait, you know, three to seven minutes for the tea to brew. By the time it brewed, I would have to run to a meeting. And I was never satisfied with the quality of, of tea bags that were available Um, Because usually tea bags are made with what's referred to as tea dust. It's the last part of the tea manufacturing or or harvesting process. So it's not as flavorful. Hmm. And, um, you know, I I, I saw an opportunity um, where for someone who lives a very active lifestyle like myself at the time, there was no tea on the market that really catered to me, right? I still wanted a true loose leaf tea experience, but I just didn't have the time necessarily to, to make it the traditional way. And so that's where the, the idea first blossomed of can tea be simplified? Um, can the tea making process be simplified without sacrificing the quality of the loose leaf tea? And so that sent me on a path of, you know, a year and a half, two years of experimenting with different tea blends and different tea varieties. And after that period of time, it evolved into this notion of a tea drop. And, um, you know, from there, I started selling it at farmer's markets and at artisanal fairs. And I saw that people really responded well to it, even though I didn't have any fancy packaging. I think I was like selling it in, in Ziploc bags. It was, mm-hmm. it was not, it was not a, a pretty experience, but people instantly grasped the concept of like, oh, you just add that to hot water and stir? That's, that's super cool. And they would try it and be like, oh, this is actually amazing. This tea tastes great. And that was the first, um, you know, point of, of positive feedback I received to be like, you know, I think not only is this like, a passion project for me. I enjoy doing it, but I think there might be a business here. Mm -hmm. So when you first started it, it was, well, first I want to make sure that we call to attention the fact that you mentioned you didn't have the perfect, perfect, excuse me, packaging and all those things. Cause sometimes we wait to go to the, you know, the artisanal market or the event or whatever until we have what we think is perfect. But the fact that you were like, no, this is a great idea. I'm going to go out there and try it and see if people like it in your Ziploc bags or whatever you had is something I want to make sure everyone catches that you didn't wait until, right. You had all the things all together before you got out there. Yeah. I, you know, for me, it's very important. And I know that there's a, there's a quote, it's like famous in Silicon Valley, um, called, you know, shipping beats perfection. Mm. And what that really means is that just getting something out there, getting Mm. someone's response to something is kind of the most critical thing you can do in the, in the early days. Because you don't want to invest all your time and energy to create this perfect, what you, in your mind, what is you a perfect, think is perfect product. Right. And then you bring it to market and you've invested all this time and, and perhaps even money and realize, oh, that's actually not what people want. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think I, I, I always, and I think that also comes from the fact I'm just an impatient person, that I always just wanted to have something to, to share with people and evolve it from there. So my initial drops, you know, were nowhere near the, the quality that they are today, but it was enough to say, Hey, here's a rough concept. Um, would you guys drink this and just share them with my friends and colleagues? And I actually, I remember on my birthday is when I launched, um, this, this idea that, Hey, or socialize it with, with friends. And I, and I said on Facebook, you know, I, I'm coming up with this idea. I would love to send you a free box of, of these tea drops just for you to try it and give me feedback. Um, obviously they weren't in, in perfect format and, and whatnot, but a lot of my friends took me up on that offer. And that was really the first input and feedback that helped us evolve to, um, you know, our next, our next phase at that point. And sometimes it's as simple as reaching out to your circle, right. And saying that you have yeah. this thing that you want people to try, especially if you're letting them know, I want feedback. So no one feels obligated to say, Oh, this was perfect. This was great. You're saying, yeah. I want feedback. I want you to try out this thing. Yeah. And you'd be surprised just how generous, um, you know, your network of friends are people mm-hmm. want you, you know, ge- in general, what I've been so amazed in this journey is that, um, you know, it's not that people live vicariously through you, but I think everyone can rally behind someone tr- trying to to bring their passion into the world, whatever that looks like. Mm-hmm. It's an amazing thing about, I feel, the human um, spirit is that people really want to rally and, and help you bring this to life. And I was so overwhelmed with um, just how positive my friends were. Like I had, you know, from that Facebook post, maybe 70 or 80 people, maybe mm-hmm. more. Wow. Come out and say, hey, I want I want to like send me send me this and I will be happy to provide feedback. So it, it's pretty incredible. 
Was your feedback um, formalized? Did you have something that you just like gave me it, comments or email or did you have no, a quick survey for someone? I actually, I people? sent it with, with every box. I sent a, a, a uh, uh, I remember printing out a survey for them mm-hmm. to, to give feedback. Um, and so it would, it would say, and then I think even there was a link I had something linked to, to survey monkey or something where they could just go online if they want to quickly fill it out right? and give me feedback on what they liked, what they didn't like, um, flavor profiles they would might, might want to see in the future. A lot of different dimensions I had outlined. Right. And that gives you data that you can use as research. Exactly. Excellent. So going back just a little though to when you first started or when you were inspired, I should say, to think about creating this, even at first as a passion project, just for the women listening and a few good men, I always say, but for the women Mm -hmm. entrepreneurs listening who might be pre-launch, even pre-idea, the fact that it was while you were creating this tea or trying to make tea for yourself, and maybe you had done it a few times and then thought there has to be an easier way to do this. Were you already in the space where you were thinking about entrepreneurship or thinking of, you know, going that route and then just looking for what the idea might be? Or was it really, you know, you were so inspired in that moment that the idea came to you and you thought, I, could, I should try this. And then eventually it became a business. I think it's a combination of both. Mm-hmm. Um, like, I, like I mentioned earlier, you know, regarding my parents, I didn't realize the impact that that had on me. I don't think, you know, as you grow up, you really internalize the impact of that you, things that you might take for granted. So I grew up in a pretty entrepreneurial household. I just didn't even realize I did. So mm-hmm. in the back of my mind, even though I was working a corporate job, I always thought, oh, you know, I think I'll do something on my own one day. I didn't really know what that would look like or how that would manifest, but it always was kind of this, this, um, the sense in the back of my mind that I would do that. And so when the idea for tea drops came and it was first a passion project, it wasn't scary for me to make that leap and say, you know, I think this could be a business one day. Obviously there's a lot of steps in between you thinking something is a viable business and actually making it happen. But I think because I had exposure to uh, entrepreneurship informally (laughs) in my youth, I, I knew that it's something that, that could be a great possibility for me one day. How long did you stay in your full-time position before you made the complete leap? It was about six to eight months. Um, mm-hmm. So at the time, you know, I got that initial feedback. And then it was, it was basically mentally preparing myself, you know, once I realized, oh, I actually do want to pursue this full-time. Because it came to a point where I felt I had, you know, one foot in one boat and another foot in another boat because I had a very demanding job at, at my, in my corporate um, field. And I had a very, you know, tea drops was becoming, um, very consuming, you know, after I would get back from work and on my weekends, it was all I would do and think about. So I felt torn because I, I felt in, in pursuing both, I'm not doing any particular role justice. So that was the first kind of notion for me that I, I need to make a decision, right? Do I stay and, 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 and I have a great career path here, or do I jump ship and give tea drops a try? And when I thought about the worst case scenario of what would happen, sure, like tea drops could definitely fail and mm-hmm. I would lose my initial savings. But at the end of the day, I would have learned so much from that experience. And I knew that I could always go back into the workforce and, and, and get a similar job that I had before. So when you looked at that and you really looked at, at what the um, worst case scenario was, it actually wasn't that bad because I could, you know, yes, okay, losing your savings is never good. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, um, I was young enough where I'm like, all right, well, even if this doesn't work out, I, I'll, I'll make it up. I'll, you know, I, don't, I don't have a problem downsizing my life to an extreme to make something work. So for me, um, it felt like something that was worth trying. Now, did you finance in the beginning with your savings? I did. So I, I took some savings out. And then I also did something that people might consider risky, which is, you know, at that kind of a year before, maybe two years, I purchased a home and I took a home equity line of credit on my house. Mm-hmm. Um, and with that, with the, some of that, I, 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 um, I uh, contributed towards the initial capital for my business. So it was a combination of savings and that. 
Right. What did you need to um, primarily, I guess, what bigger things did you need to invest in at that time? Was it the product itself, having it manufactured, packaging, combination of all those things? Yeah. So for the first um, six months, eight months, I was manufacturing this at my house or my apartment mm. at the time. Really? Um, yeah. It was, it was, we, it, the California had passed this law called cottage food law, which enabled, you know, that's, that's how a lot of, um, farmers market vendors can make product at home and sell it up to Mm -hmm. a certain revenue threshold. So I was making this at home and the big investment was packaging. You know, I designed, initially designed, uh, our first gen of boxes, which came in these, in these wood, wood boxes, sliding wood boxes. Um, they were very different than any other tea packaging on shelf because I wanted it to stand out, be different, still pay respect to the tradition of the old tea chests of the 15th, 16th century when tea came from Asia over to Europe, but mm-hmm. also modernize that look a bit. So um, when I when I looked into what were the, what was the minimum run I could I could um, print of these boxes, you know, you needed to at least print a thousand or two thousand units. And when you are doing something at that scale, it, it's just a lot of capital up front to purchase it. So that was a cost. Um, also, I decided to patent the idea. So there's legal fees with that. Um, and then, you know, just manufacturing the product, actually buying the equipment that you need, the ingredients. Um, and then also, you know, because I needed to get the message out, I, I wanted to participate in some trade shows to expose people to my product. And so when you're first starting out, it seems like a lot of money, right? To not just secure your place, your booth, but also you need to build your booth right. with, with, with uh, decor and everything else and, and marketing collateral, like, like catalogs. So all of those things um, add up and you don't know exactly how to maybe budget initially, but through trial and error. And if you can do that, um, you know, figure that out early on, it gives you a sense of where your, your main buckets of, of costs are coming from. And at what point did you decide to bring in investors into the business? Yeah, so that was a tough decision for me. And I think a lot of, um, you know, women entrepreneurs or any entrepreneurs for that matter, think about what what that means. And mm-hmm. I didn't come from the venture capital world or invest, you know, I didn't even understand how, how I mean, I understood how in the role of investors, but when it came down to a consumer packaged good business, I didn't know what that meant. Um, and so for me, it was just first understanding if I bring on investors, what does that mean in terms of, um, do I have a clear plan of how I would spend their money and not just how do I, how would I spend the money, but how I would plan to return and, and grow their money. And until I could answer that question, it was really hard for me. And everyone has a different, um, comfort level with that. I, I wanted to have that answer in my mind um, before taking on other people's money because I do take it very seriously that people are trusting you, right? With what could be their nest egg. I don't, you know, who knows mm-hmm. what, what it is. But it, it's it, to me, I, I take that responsibility very seriously and I wanted to make sure I had a clear plan. So the first couple of years, I didn't take on investment. I kind of self-funded while I figured out what were the key channels of where we're finding success and, and distributing our product. Um, what are the key hires I think I need to make next? And once I had that in my mind, that's when I went out and, and started seeking investment. And I did a combination of talking to, you know, what we refer to as angel investors. So people who just write one-off checks, friends and family, um, as well as some traditional uh, venture capital investors. And I ended up, you know, cause I didn't know this world at all. I ended up reading a book that was super helpful for anyone out there that wants to wants to just, you know, brush up more on what, what investment entails. Um, there, there's, there's a book called venture deals by Brad Feldman. Okay. And it's almost like a, like, like venture capital for dummies, I want to say, but it's helpful in framing what are the different investment instruments out there? You know, what's the difference between a convertible note and equity raise? Um, and a lot of those things, like I didn't know what the difference was when I first started. And so it just helps you get, get your bearings on, on what the difference is, what, what's important in a term sheet when you sign one. Um, so a lot of those fundamentals, I just learned on my own and reading these types of, of um, books and resources. 
Venture Deals by Brad Feldman. I'll make sure I link to it for everybody listening. But thank you for that resource. It's always good to have a good resource. Exactly. And I think, you know, this can be a very intimidating process. I totally get that. I mean, I went through it. I must have talked to over 70 different investors before we raised our round. Um, Because, you know, initially you're not going to get your pitch perfect the first time. Um, Your pitch is going to evolve. You're going to learn from each no that you get from an investor and realize, okay, what are they looking for? Um, You know, sometimes it just takes that experience to go through that and realize what's important in um, when when you're approaching investors, whether they're angel or VC. Did you get any coaching through that process? The pitch process? Um, You know, I wouldn't say coaching. So so here would be my recommendation. I ended up applying for pitch competitions um, and through, you know, not through any intention. I just was part of this woman founders network in LA and I, and I, they announced that they were, they had a pitch competition where you could win $20,000 if you got first place. And so, you know, I looked at their criteria. I'm like, Oh, well, we kind of fit that criteria. I applied on a whim and we ended up um, making the top 10. And then we actually won first place in that pitch. And in that process, they gave us as a resource, a pitch coach. Um, and my pitch coach was, was incredible. In fact, we still work together. And she really helped me hone in on the content of my pitch, my delivery, um, all of the facets that, that might be important to an investor or someone on the panel. And that really helped me do that. And I realized the value of these pitch competitions is not so much winning them, but it's the process of going through that exercise of really crystallizing what your idea is, um, you know, thinking through the nitty gritty, your financials, your go-to-market strategy, um, all of these elements that investors at the end of the day want to know, um, and having the, the, the ability to work on that through these pitch competitions. So I found that that to be really valuable and that, that definitely helped me, um, get better at talking to investors just overall. A lot of business owners I've heard too, who have gone through pitch competitions also say, like you said, it's not necessarily about winning, but you get all this uh, experience getting feedback and those questions that investors ask. But also they say, even if you don't win, you never know who else is in the room, who might not be on the panel, who might be listening, Absolutely. who might be right, looking for someone like you. So for people to think about that as well. Yeah. I mean, through that, I've gotten so many press opportunities, other investors come on board, partner, brand partnerships, mm-hmm. um, just a great network of women too, that you now, that I now can talk you know, female business owners that I can now talk to and we can, uh, trade, trade, uh, war stories, war with stories or, right, right. you know, so it's, it's been a, a great experience to expose yourself in that way. And I know it takes vulnerability and I know a lot of people are shy about talking about their business in such a detailed way, I find, I mean, it's one thing that I notice is that people don't like completely sharing their idea, not because they don't want to, you know, they don't, it's, it, they do want to share it, but they also are hesitant to receive um, what they consider critical feedback. And I would really push, push you to say, um, think about what you're most insecure about your business and you should be talking about that. You should bring that to the forefront. You should be sharing your, um, you know, you should be sharing your idea all the time. Um, and, and hearing what people think, obviously there's noise and you don't want to take in everyone's opinion about how you should run your business, but there is value in listening to the critical feedback. Um, and then, you know, shifting and changing your pitch or your product, or your service accordingly. I think it's really important to listen to that and not be afraid of what the feedback might be. And you've done one round of fundraising so far, right? Yeah. Yeah, Okay. What was your, your first round was, I know I read, did I read it? Did I read a million dollars? Was that your first raise? So we raised 1.9. 1.9. Okay. Yeah. So close to 2 million. Nice. Um, And that, you know, that was a process to do. It was, um, it was, like I said, a lot of, I mentioned over 70 investors, maybe over 150, 200 different conversations, a mm-hmm. lot of pitch competitions in between, a lot of no's. Um, but I just focused on the business and building the business and being as scrappy and resourceful as possible and proving out that, hey, there is something here. Um, I am a big believer in being scrappy early on, doing a lot with a little. Mm-hmm. Um, and if you can show that traction... And show to investors that, hey, just as I'm taking care of this money and being scrappy, that's how I'm going to use your capital um, to grow. 
I feel like that gives them, you know, the confidence they need to actually see it in action. At the same time, you know, getting more comfortable and sharing my story, sharing my pitch, um, and working on that is is was also a pretty important component. So these pitch competitions help sharing your idea with as many people as possible to get their feedback helps. Um, and through that experience, you know, more soon enough, you start building your your little community that supports you and that wants to participate in your round. So what would you say since you had a you know significant round? So I wanted to mention a number just so everybody could know um, the, the level that you're what's the word I'm looking for? Playing in is what first came to mind. So we'll say playing in the area that you're playing in. But what would you say though, having investors now, um, has there, if at all, been any compromises that you felt like you've had to make? And I ask that because usually people think, oh, when you raise a certain amount of money, you know, we all have, whether true or not, these myths about what, um, what investors do when they come into a business or what it's going to look like. So I'm interested from you, what your experience has been like and what you would share with us. Yeah. I mean, I definitely think it's very important to think about who, who um, participates in your investment round mm-hmm. um, because it's just kind of like a marriage. You know, you're going to be in this partnership for the long haul. And that doesn't mean you're not going to have disagreements. Um, you know, every relationship you're tested and you might have squabbles and fights and have different points of view. But the main point that I, that I consider is, can you come to the table can you rationally have a discussion with them? Um, can you, you know, feel like you can be vulnerable and put your heart out there and talk about the difficulties of your business and feel supported um, rather than um, interrogated? And so those elements I find are really important. Um, obviously, you know, anytime you take on investment, there's a, there's a level of, of expectations that come with it. I mean, investors don't just invest out of their goodwill. Mm-hmm. They obviously are looking for a return. And, um, just like any investment, you can't fault them for that. That's why they're investing in you. And so as soon as you you kind of understand that concept, but you also recognize that they also want, um, that, they're, that they're willing to be good partners in that process, that's important. Um, it was really important to me as I started, you know, I didn't really, when I started pitching, I didn't know anything about the investor ecosystem. And it, it really was midway that I realized that less than 2% of female founders get funding or at least mm-hmm. were funded last year. And I and think for women just, of color, it's like less than 1%. Yes. Yeah. And, and it, that's just an eg- egregious stat. Like mm-hmm. I, I look at that and I'm like, this, this just is like, uh, so there's so many things wrong with it. Right. Um, so it was very important for me to engage as many females as possible in my, in, in participating in my round, Mm -hmm. um, exposure to the women founders network was, was a huge, um, win for me because it exposed me to other female investors, venture capital firms that focus on, on women led enterprises. And so I'm happy to report that, that over half of our raise, the majority of our raise rather was, um, female funded. Mm. either by angel investors or female-led VCs. And um, it was interesting because I had a lot of first-time female investors come to me, angel investors, and say, hey, I've never done this before, but I really believe in you and I really believe in your business. Um, I only have you know, maybe 10000 to really invest and give at this point in time. You know, would, you consider, would you consider a check of that size? And for me, I was like, yes, because if it was their first time, you know, this is their first time contributing in, in what you call, um, investing in this, in this, in this manner. Um, it was important for me to expose women to that process. Um, because, you know, hopefully t drops does well and, uh, we can, you know, make a great return for them. And in the process, um, you know, they they got the chance to participate in that ecosystem and really change that and start to change that narrative of, mm-hmm. of more female participation in the investor space. So that was my hope with the round. Obviously, like we're a small drop in the in a big bucket, but but we have to start. That's somewhere. how you fill up the bucket, though. Yeah, Everyone I know. Drop but, at a time, right? Exactly. So that was a very important um, and intentional route that I went with this race. And I think that's so important because like you said, it's for women who are 
you know, giving $10,000 who don't necessarily have a million or don't have a big company to invest to know that they can be involved in this as well. And that's how we continue to build with those little drops filling up the bucket yeah. because people think, oh, I just have X. And, you know, if people don't accept it as you did, then those people are just out of the way. They're not allowed to participate. Yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. Exactly. So what would you say that going through the process with um, getting investors involved in your business, that whole process in general, in what ways has that shaped the entrepreneur that you are today? I think that it's made me a lot more Mm self-aware. I think in having so many conversations, whether they're positive or you hear no, and you might hear a no for good reason, like any investor is willing to take the time to say no. And here are the reasons why I'm passing uh, on on this investment. It's it, that's golden feedback, um, and I look at that feedback and I look at my business again and say, you know, is there tr- is there a nugget of truth? I mean, obviously people just pass and maybe have no good reason for passing. You know, no investor gets an investment 100 percent right all the time. Um, so you have to look at the no's and 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 find find the goodness in that. Like find find what is what is this no telling me? Is there something here that I should be listening to? Um, because I think some, some entrepreneurs are just like, no, this is my idea. This is it. Um, if you don't like it, you know, like take it or leave it type of attitude. And I would, you know, for me, it's been important to, to see if there was any kernel of truth in some of the feedback I was getting. So in that way, it's made me a lot more self-aware. Like where are the deficits in myself as an entrepreneur? Where are the deficits, um, in my, in my company, um, maybe in what our brand vision is, um, and not necessarily deficits. It's just like, how can things be improved? So, um, that's probably been a big takeaway f- for me. What would you say has been the biggest challenge in your business so far and how are you overcoming it? Well, I think that there's challenges every day of all different sizes. Right. That's um, just entrepreneurship. I think that's just part of it. But I also think it's realizing to, uh, my strengths and where my limitations are and wherever my limitations, um, you know, having the right people and resources on board to combat that and knowing that I don't always have all the answers and that's okay. Um, but now I've been able, I'm very fortunate to bring on people who are really strong in areas that I'm not. Um, and I really rely on them to, to help, um, help with those blind spots. I think another thing that as you are getting so many no's, you know, in the process of anything you're building and just getting that rejection is um, is how do you how do you manage um, that rejection? And I think this plays into mental health as an entrepreneur. Mm-hmm. And I think not enough is really spoken about it. But it it definitely you know hearing no after no after no, especially in the early days for me, was very hard as it as it is hard for for the common person. Um, and I think you have to, and also because so you know your business becomes your life in a sense that I'm working on this. 12 to 15 hours a day. It's my baby. Um, at the same time, you know, you're pitching it and you're hearing these no's. You have to find that, that balance for yourself and you have to make your mental health a priority as you're building a business. Um, it's, it's probably, you know, easier said than done, but over the years I've evolved to kind of think about what my non-negotiables are. Um, as like I'm building this and it's a fun thing, but how do I maintain my sanity while doing it? Um, for me, it's, you know, being able to spend time with my family, getting eight hours of sleep, um, always incorporating some kind of physical activity into my day, like working out or rock climbing or dancing. So I kind of have figured out the things that are important to me that I don't want to compromise in, 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 you know, as I build this business, um, that because they keep me sane, they keep me grounded and, um, I want to be here for the long haul. Thank you for sharing that. And it's so important to, I I love what you said about coming up with the non-negotiables or the things that you're not going to compromise on when it comes to taking care of yourself. Because it's so easy for us to say, oh, I didn't have time to work out today. I mean, I've done this. I didn't have time Mm -hmm. to do this. I didn't have time. The next thing you know, it's, I didn't have time to work out this month because there's always going to be something. But if you Mm -hmm. make it a non-negotiable and figure out how to do it, then that's something that can be, as you said, supporting you in all kinds of ways beyond just staying in shape and fit, it really does help you mentally to be able to, even to know that, as I have learned over the years, that you've kept this commitment to yourself. 
Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, that's part of it too, is, is being accountable for what you say you'll do. And I find, you know, we're as like, I, I, I don't want to speak on behalf of all women, but I mm-hmm. will say for myself, I'm a lot more, um, lenient on pushing things back for myself, but I'm there to give a hundred percent to other people. Right. And it's just funny how like for yourself, you're like, Oh, I'll get to that for myself later on. But um, everyone else, you keep your word. Yeah. And everyone else, you keep your word. It's like, no, keep your word to yourself too. It's just as important. Mm-hmm. So in closing, if you think over your life and career and you had the chance to thank only one person whose support was critical to you personally or professionally, who would that be? And what would you say? Um, so it can't be two, two people. <laughs> it can. It can be. You make your own well, I, I mean, I definitely want to say my parents, like I've, I've um, been very fortunate to have very supportive parents that um, have always said, you know, do whatever you want in life, just, just be happy. And, um, having them be my first, uh, my first experience, uh, you know, seeing entrepreneurs in action to my mom, you know, was there from the early days making the tea drops in my kitchen with me, um, packaging it with me. Like she's been through, I've, I've put her through, so through some hard times in the early days. And so mm-hmm. I look at, um, how fortunate I am to have that type of support from my parents. Other people get it from other people. Um, but I, I do, I do want to acknowledge them for all that they've done. Did they at any point ever try to discourage is the only word I can think of, but just because they hustled with as uh, entrepreneurs on the side of their job. So maybe they have, have had a different experience. Did they ever try to say to you, are you sure you want to be an entrepreneur? I mean, definitely in the beginning, I think it's uh-huh. a big leap to go from a very cush job, right. um, corporate job that, you know, it, maybe when they were younger, they would have just aspired to be in the same position I was at that age. Um, and so they looked at what I was, you know, giving up to pursue this. But I also, my, my you know, my whole family were big into, into self-development um, mm-hmm. and uh, so much of entrepreneurship, that path is about personal evolution, right? Um, confronting so many things about yourself, learning and growing. And I mean, if you make it so, I mean, you could look at it different ways. But for me, uh, entrepreneurship is such this this vehicle to self-discovery. Yeah. And I think they saw that side of it and been like, well, if nothing else, you're going to learn a lot. <laughs> you're going to learn a lot. Yourself. So right, exactly. a lot about yourself, a lot about what you're made of. You know, this is where the rubber meets the road and you're going to learn. So, um, so yes, there was trepidation, but also an understanding that no matter what path I chose, there was going to be um, some self-growth and, and lots of learning. Excellent. Now, what are the ways that we can support you for everyone? I'm sure everyone wants to know where to get tea drops. I'll make sure I have a link, but tell everybody where they can find you just so they know. Yep. So um, if you want to follow me personally, I kind of just update, uh, provide periodic updates um, about just entrepreneurship and growing tea drops. Um, I'm at Sashi Chandran on Instagram. And then our website, company website is www.myteadrop.com. And then our social media handle is at my tea drop on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook. And um, we have a 20% off coupon Ooh. on our website. <laughs> that's VIP community. And that's VIP C O M M U N I T E A that you can use um, just for you special listeners. And, um, on our, I will say on our Instagram account through our stories and through our posts, we, we, we post a lot beyond just our product and and tea in general. We have a lot of fun facts, um, recipes, um, mental health is also an issue that's important to us. So we have a lot of articles and topics and videos. So please come check us out. We really want to build, um, a community. So when they go to myteadrop.com and purchase, which I'm sure people will, the, the discount code is VIP Communa T-E-A. That they yes. Enter. Excellent. Exactly. All right, everyone. I'll have all the information at the link, but you heard Sashi say that you can go there. You have to, if nothing else, you have to experience 
tea jar. I love them. It's so good. Have oh, experience. thank you so much. Absolutely. Thank you. I'm so glad we connected and was able to share yeah. about this. And thank you for going, you know, diving into some areas of your business and sharing what that experience is like working with investors, especially, and uh, just the whole process. It's good to hear from someone who has been through it. Yeah, happy to share it. And, and thank you so much for, for the conversation. I really enjoyed it. Absolutely. Now, before you go, what's a parting piece of advice from you to our listeners about anything? My favorite quote is, leave people and things better than how you found them. And that's something I kind of keep in mind, whether it's a you know, conversation with an Uber driver or just meeting someone in passing, um, all the way to your, you know, your friends and family leaving people and things better than how you found them. And that's um, just a very important philosophy to me. All right. I hope you enjoyed that conversation with Sashi. To find out more about her, to find out more about tea drops, trust me, again, if you're a tea lover, you're going to love them. Make sure you go to supportissexy.com. Go to that search icon at the top and just type in Sashi, S-A-S-H-E-E. Her show notes page will pop up with the links, the resources, all the ways to get in touch with her, the ways to find out more about Tea Drops Tea, and to get your own, supportissexy.com. Just search Sashi. Thank you so much for being here. You know I appreciate you. It would not be the same without you. If you enjoy what you've been hearing on the podcast, I would love it if you'd leave me a review. Thank you so much. I know I got, I've got i gotten away from reading reviews. I hope to get back to that. So many things going on, but I want you to know that I see them. I appreciate you. Thank you for reviewing an episode. Thank you for reviewing the podcast in general. It really helps to get the feedback. People say it helps to show, show up and more suggestions and that kind of thing when people, I don't know if that's true, who knows? Apple at least has its own thing going on, right? Who really knows how that works? I just want you to know that I appreciate you taking the time, the energy, the effort to listen to the podcast and to leave a review. Whether you do it or not, thank you so much for considering it, but I truly appreciate if you take that extra step and do that. So if you like it, leave a review, let me know what you think. All right. I appreciate you again. Thank you for being here. And until we chat again, always remember, support is sexy and having it all doesn't mean doing it all alone. And I'll talk to you soon. Take care.